Thank you very much. Just turn it on. <coughs> well, this earthquake we normally call 2011 Tohoku Oki earthquake, and this really caught us by surprise. The main reason why this was so surprising was that we really ha haven't experienced any large earthquake. Uh, maybe the pointer, if there is any. Okay. Can I use this yeah. one? Okay. Um, the rupture zone of this earthquake is in this part, offshore mainly. And if you look at past history for more than 1,000 years in Japan, most of the large events happened over here to the north. But in this part, uh, the largest event was more like eight or smaller. And uh, nothing really large has ever happened for more than 1,000 years. And that's really the main reason why this earthquake caught us by surprise. And uh, these days, in Sorry, can I adjust your mic? <laughs> okay. Only exception is um, this event, 869, a Jogan earthquake, uh, given 8.3. And this has been known for many years. So, in a way, uh, tsunami hazard and shaking hazard in the northern part of Japan was really recognized for a long time. However, it's really difficult to prepare for an event more than 1,000 years ago. So for that reason, uh, this event was really surprising. And I happened to be in Tokyo uh, have a meet, at the meeting, and then um, this event happened, and the building started squeaking and shaking. And uh, it was quite exciting. But I knew that uh, uh, this one was very far from Tokyo, and uh, magnitude 8 plus or something. Uh, very quickly, uh, in 20 minutes after the origin time, uh, the global seismic network system came up with magnitude of 8.9 and 8.9 to 9, and this was really a big surprise because uh, in Japan nothing like this happened in the recording, recorded history. And also, more importantly, the location of the source was very close to the trench offshore underwater. So just combination of those two, uh, it was very obvious that this was a very rare event, perhaps once every thousand year type event, with extremely high tsunami potential. It was almost obvious very, from the very beginning. Then question is, what happened? Why such an uh, unusual event happened in Japan? And for the last three weeks or so, a really large number of scientists have investigated this one. And the overall picture has emerged very clearly. So I want to show you what. Uh, this is a sort of GPS displacement field. There are lots of stations in Japan. And uh, what happened here is these places moved by two to three meter eastward here. That's a very big displacement. And just by looking at the uh, vector, uh, we don't need really very sophisticated seismologists to tell that the main source, main actor, was somewhere around here. And indeed, the analysis, which was done subsequently, showed very clearly that most of the slip uh, due to faulting happened offshore, very close to trench over here. And these are three different results. So the details are different. But overall, you can see the large displacement in the seafloor happened over here. The slip over here was nearly 20 to 70 meters or so, depending upon uh, different people. But uh, in any case, the main action happened beneath seafloor, very close to trench underwater. And this large deformation produced large tsunami all along the Japanese coast from here all the way to here. And that's really what happened. And uh, these days, seismological research can move very quickly, so we can have this kind of picture very quickly. Uh, this is the analysis from seismic waves. The, the slide I showed you before uh, showed the results from GPS, but also we can use seismic waves, and it turned out this more or less the same result. Main strip happened over here, so that conclusion <laughs> is very robust. One other interesting thing is many people felt very strong shaking over here. And if the main source is that far, you wouldn't expect strong shaking. No, what happened? Apparently what happened is this event is so complex that the main displacement happened over here. However, uh, it also triggered very high frequency waves very close to the coast. For that reason, there was strong shaking over here. Um, 
But the main displacement happened here offshore, which was primarily responsible for a large tsunami. And it's a very complex event, but uh, this is a very simple uh, summary. And this is essentially a summary. Main displacement happened here, which triggered high frequency over here, which was responsible for a strong ground motion here. And aftershocks happened over here. So this affected the entire Tohoku district in Japan, uh, primarily by tsunami along the coast. So scientifically, this picture is very well understood within two, three weeks after the event. Well, I just want to show you the way the Japanese preparedness program went. Uh, this area um, really experienced large tsunamis for the last uh, even 100 years or so. So they knew that the big tsunami was coming in, anyway. So they built a very large uh, breakwater here, uh, two kilometers from here to here, and the height is nearly eight meters above sea level. So by any standard, it was a very substantial wall. And unfortunately, this was damaged. And there was some question regarding how effective this was. But according to the recent report, this was sort of effective. In a way, it delayed the tsunami by six minutes. And six minutes is a long time for people to escape. So certainly, this did have some effect, although they could have been built better if enough resources were available. And also, in addition to that, they built walls on the beach and uh, this wasn't very high enough. Uh, over here, apparently, there was 23 meter tsunami came during this event. So probably this wasn't very effective. However, <coughs> at the site slightly to the north, uh, they built a very high wall, 18 meters here, like this one. And uh, this is uh, the seaward, and this is inland. And this type of facility was very badly damaged during this earthquake. However, there was no water behind this one. It was completely dry, and apparently some people were on top of this wall watching tsunami. So in a way, uh, it did work. Of course, this is according to the newspaper, so um, more probably detailed invest investigations will be done. But uh, what's really important is, if we had enough technology, and if we spent enough amount of money, and it is possible to prepare for tsunami. So in in addition to this kind of preparedness, if we do have a more rapid uh, warning system, both tsunami and earthquake, certainly there is a good possibility that we can reduce uh, seismic tsunami hazard. So I just want to briefly discuss how our warning system works. It's a very complex system, so I can't really explain to you uh, very well. So I want, to, I want you to ask questions later. Well, the basic principle of earthquake early warning system is really very simple. A uh, radio wave is faster than any of the seismic waves. And there are two waves in seismic waves, P wave and S wave. Sometimes this is called the primary wave. This is called the uh, secondary wave. Sometimes this is called the pressure wave. This is called the shear wave. But anyhow, a P wave is uh, 1.7 times faster. So that's very important. So P wave coming from the source carries information, so it will tell you what happened at the source. So in principle, if you really want to understand what happened at the source, you can just look at P wave because it carries all the information. It doesn't, have, it doesn't carry much of energy, so it won't do you any harm. The S wave, on the other hand, carries most of the energy, but because it's slower, um, it, came, it comes later, but uh, cause strong shaking. So for seismic research, we love S-Wave. This tells us lots of things. However, for hazard point of view, we hate it. <laughs> this really slow, it doesn't tell us much, then <laughs> it does damage. So this is a principle. So just catch P-Wave to understand what happened at the source and then predict what's going to happen uh, during S-Wave, which carries energy. Then send that information by radio wave, which goes much faster. So for people at some distance away, they can get complete information, not complete, good information regarding what happened at the source. Uh, this is really the basic principle. The question is how to implement this one. And uh, one more important thing, there is one aspect, uh, two kinds of uh, early warning. We sometimes call it regional approach. The other one is on-site approach. And I believe this distinction is very important in, in understanding what happened after this earthquake. In the modern system of earthquake early warning system, in a way they use hybrid system, uh, both regional and on-site. Um, 
the way it works is like this one. You have an earthquake, and the wave propagates to the structure, and you want to issue warning during that time. Well, in case of regional approach, we do have stations uh, over a very large area near the, near the source. So you locate it, and uh, you estimate how large it is, and then um, estimate magnitude, then estimate uh, ground motion intensity at some uh, site uh, away from the source. And this is regional. And this JMA, Japan Meteorological Agency, early warning network, uh, Richard showed, is primarily based upon this method. They have the stations along the coast. They detect seismic waves and estimate how large the event is and they estimate how strong the ground motion would be. On the other hand, uh, there is on-site approach. Uh, regional approach is quite good. It's very sophisticated. However, it takes time, of course, because you have to locate, you have to determine magnitude. So main difficulty here is people who are within 30 kilometers of the epicenter may not get the information before shaking starts. So sometimes this is a very difficult point because uh, people who are more strongly affected don't get the information. Uh, on the other hand, this on-site approach um, is very different. Uh, in case of on-site approach, you, do, you rely on instrument very close to your structure. So if something comes here very strong, you say much stronger thing will come. And uh, the Japanese railway, a bullet train system, is essentially now using this one in conjunction with this one. But the very quick uh, warning comes from this one because this is very fast. You are watching ground motion, and if you see some strong motion, then you give warning. And this is called threshold warning. You really can't tell how strong it's going to be, but it's strong enough so that you have to prepare. And I will go back to the uh, bread train system. So these are some differences. There are some differences, but in the modern system, in a way, they use hybrid system. Uh, let's talk about JMA system, uh, which worked very well during this event. So at the time of the earthquake, usually the source is here. Usually only one station can record a wave. Uh, so they determine the location, but not very accurately, but send the information to whatever structure. And in this case, sometimes uh, you underestimate uh, strength, intensity, and you underestimate magnitude. However, if you wait for 10 seconds, you have more stations, so you have a better estimate of magnitude, say 7.1, and you have better estimate of ground shaking. And then if you wait, say, 20 seconds, of course, you have much better estimate. Of course, you lose time. So there's always trade-off between accuracy and time. And this is the JMS system. And this really worked very well. Our JMS system was implemented in 2007 in Japan, and they had many success stories. Of course, I mean, there are some difficulties, but uh, in, in the, the most problematic thing is, as I said, as long as you use a regional method, uh, warning at short distances are not usually available at distances less than 30 kilometers. And also, usually you talk about point, so that uh, warning for large events with large source dimension may not be very accurate. And uh, um, also, in making this effective, education and public uh, effective use of early warning system is very important. Well, how about all our um, track record? Um, well, of course, this is not very easy to say because, you know, there are so many uh, parameters. But in general, uh, this is a summary for the last, since 2007, and there are about 10 large events, larger than six, and these red circles are the success case. And uh, only really a problematic one is this false alarm. Uh, there was some instrumental problem which led to for a false alarm. But these are kind of underestimated case, but it's still, the, as a whole, the system worked. So in a way, for these events, it really worked in general very well. The real test was, we thought, uh, for the big earthquake. And then this recent earthquake happened. And as Richard explained, uh, it worked uh, very well for the place in the northern part of Japan. And overall, I was quite impressed. And how do we communicate? 
this uh, information to the users. And there are many ways. And the one most commonly used is the TV. And uh, I was in Tokyo uh, during this aftershock sequence and watching TV. And on TV, this screen shows up. What this says is earthquake location and uh, the names of the affected prefectures, Iwate, Miyagi, Akita, Yamagata. And this says a big earthquake happened, and you have strong ground motion, but it doesn't say uh, how big, and it doesn't say the countdown. So in a way, the information is limited, but this appears on TV screen. So p whoever is watching TV gets this information very quickly. The second one is J alert message. Uh, sometimes they have public address system to warn the local people. And cell phone is getting very uh, popular. I don't have a cell phone myself, so I can't speak for that. Uh, Docomo, AU, and SoftBank, uh, they are having broadcast sort of method. And if your cell phone is turned on, uh, you'll get it. And uh, at the meeting I was at, at the University of Tokyo, all, all of their professors and others, they didn't have any cell phone. So <laughs> we didn't get that information. However, if someone had a cell phone, certainly we would have had much better information very quickly. So we have to educate professors. <laughs> anyway, uh, there are a large number of, of course, 50, 52 million can receive them. And this can be really very effective if people recognize the importance of early warning. I'm sure this is a very important uh, medium. And of course, uh, some facilities buy this particular hardware, which has been developed by several companies. And this is very sophisticated. If you buy this one, it's essentially computer-based thing. Uh, when earthquake happened, uh, you have this display showing epicenter and the magnitude and the expected intensity and the countdown. And this, I used to have this one on, on, on the desk in Japan for some while, but nothing happened. But anyway, <laughs> uh, this is a very powerful machine if you really have it. And uh, it's in a way, as a seismologist, we found this very exciting. If something happened, you really know what's going to happen. Um, and uh, I guess, I don't know exactly how many. Uh, these are now used at power plants, of factories, schools, hospitals, shopping malls. Um, from now, probably this will be more important. Well, what happened during this 2011 event? Well, the origin time was 14, 46, 18.1, local time. I was at this meeting. The meeting started at 1.30. <laughs> so one hour and 15 minutes, uh, this happened. <laughs> and the, the meeting was canceled. Um, but anyhow, the event was located very accurately, actually, uh, by any standard. It was located here. And uh, however, the stations are all on the coast. So it took some time for fast detection of P wave. Uh, in this case, about 22 seconds from here to here. And then within eight, eight seconds after that, they uh, estimated magnitude and the intensity. So the warning issued at 46, 48 seconds, about 30 seconds after the origin time. And then S-wave um, pro propagates like this one. So it takes for S-wave to 10 seconds to 15 seconds after the warning was issued. So people in Sendai here, had at least 10 to 15 second warning time. And as uh, Max said, I mean, people who can act very quickly, five seconds is a long time. And uh, I tend to get tired of it if it takes too long. So five seconds is really good enough for doing lots of things individually. Uh, OK, this is S-wave kind of wave front. And uh, this is estimated shaking. So by and large, I think for these prefectures, uh, this system worked very well. Of course, I mean, there are always people who criticize uh, for the performance, not enough or whatever. But overall, I think uh, to capture once every thousand year kind of event, it was really amazing that this worked, worked very well. The expected shaking? No, I don't think so. Um, maybe to some extent, but I'm not sure exactly to what extent. <coughs> okay, let's skip this one. Uh, let's skip this one too. Okay, um, I mean, there are several articles. You may have seen this one. Uh, this is a professor uh, who's, uh, uh, he was uh, Kensuke Watanabe. He was apparently lecturing in the classroom. And then 2.46, the event happened. 
and uh, someone had uh, a cell phone. So they took pre precaution very quickly and everything worked very well. So th there are many success stories like this one. And uh, it was uh, terrifying, but uh, the mobile warning really helped. And uh, for at individual basis, I think the cell phone warning can be very effective. You can take whatever you want to do, and the people are very well trained, so they can make good use of warning information. And Professor Motosaka, I have known him for a long time. He was a structural engineer at Kajima Corporation, but now he's professor at Tohoku University, and he's, uh, he has a project um, working with uh, local schools uh, so that uh, they have warning system, that last system I showed you, hardware, so that uh, school kids can um, take effective uh, action at the time of warning. And uh, he, in this case, three schools, uh, this worked very well. And as you can read, uh, everyone took very proper action, uh, went underneath desk, uh, like this, this is just illustration. So he was very happy that the system works very well. And also at the University of Tohoku, they have uh, LAN and uh, apparently the earthquake early warning information was broadcast to five campuses. It's a big university with lots of campuses spread out in Sendai, but all of them received this information. So in a way, in the Sendai, which is the largest city in the affected area, the warning system worked really, very well. And this is another business meeting, and uh, of course there was a cell phone, someone had, they had it, and again, uh, the same story, and uh, they got enough information to protect themselves individually. And uh, so maybe I have to change my mind and I have to buy a cell phone. <laughs> <laughs> Um, this is one story, and again, no official report has been published, so I have to rely on uh, this news media. Um, this is actually telling us something important, I think. Uh, the Japanese bread train, uh, it was uh, built in 1960s, and even at the time when they built a uh, bread train system, they had earthquake early warning in mind, so the whole system was designed with the idea that the early warning system is available. So it's slightly different from other situations. In other cases, we already have facility, and now early warning system has become available. Then we ask how we can use it. It's somewhat different. It's a high-tech system, so they had a very good vision, very in the beginning. In countries like Japan, earthquake, you can't avoid it. So they had this system in mind. So the whole system was built uh, with the idea that the early warning is available. So what happens here is, uh, in the, in during this earthquake, in this new uh, northern part of the system, there were 24 trains. Uh, actually, how you count the number of trains is uh, sort of subjective to some judgments, so maybe sometimes 10, sometimes 24, I don't know. But quite a few trains were running because it was 2.30 in the afternoon. And the nine seismic sensors were, ha, had been deployed along the coast and the 44 sensors along the train track. So they had lots of instruments and this was part of a bread train. Uh, these are their stations, not someone else's station. And they detected the initial tremor. And this is so-called on-site training, uh, on-site warning. So they are watching ground motion. And if ground motion at multiple stations exceeded some threshold. Then everything is automatic. There is no human intervention. It basically shut off the power and uh, activate the brake, emergency brake. <laughs> of course, if every train is running on its own, this can cause a tremendous problem. But the uh, bread train is a centrally controlled system. So the information goes to the central operating site center and then power is cut off and the brakes work, so all the trains begin to slow down and stop, in this case without any derailment. And also, the bread train is built mainly on bridges and tunnels, so I think they were built very well, so the damage is on, they didn't sustain any damage on bridges or tunnels 
uh, so that uh, they could restore at least uh, uh, some operation very quickly. So in a way, this is an important system. So under certain circumstances, on-site warning is very important, not accurate. And it's probably, it's only threshold warning. You can't really tell very accurate information, but for certain uh, functions, the threshold warning is very quick and very effective. But to do that, you need to have long-term vision because you have to design the whole system so that this on-site warning can be used very effectively. But that's a very important lesson. I guess that's basically what it is. Uh, one, one other thing. I was in Tokyo, and this is pretty similar to what happened here. This is National um, Congress or Diet uh, in Japan, and uh, one of the ministers was grieved by the, the other party, and he was answering questions, and apparently, uh, not in this room, but in the, na the room adjacent to it, they were watching TV, and the TV pop-up screen came out, came out. And this is what I said. Uh, this is the screen. Uh, the regular program gets interrupted, and this appears with some beep. And what it says is urgent earthquake report, JMA, and earthquake in Miyagi, okay, happened, and a lot too strong shaking. And uh, these are the names of the prefectures, Miyagi, Iwate, Fukushima, Akita, Yamagata. So, as you can see, there's no Tokyo. So, officially, no warning was issued to Tokyo. That's sometimes people complain about it. But uh, the reason why this wasn't issued in Tokyo was the estimated intensity in Tokyo was too low to issue warning. And that's because they had to use point source. They didn't use a finite source. So, of course, I mean, there are lots of places, lots of things we can improve on it. But in principle, uh, this worked very well. So people who are in Tokyo, if they look at this one and if they are reasonably intelligent, uh, they could have very easily guessed that strong motion is coming because this event was large enough to affect these prefectures. So <laughs> it's impossible not to affect Tokyo. So the official warning wasn't right in a way but to this kind of information was very effective. I, we didn't have this one, unfortunately. At the meeting I was in, there was no TV either. <laughs> so we didn't have this information. So anyway, this is essentially the summary. And uh, I think Richard had uh, some nice videos and movies. So depending upon how questions go, yeah, for any, any questions, and uh, there are many experts, we can answer them. That's my, that's my guess, I think. Uh, uh, excuse me. <laughs> well, basically, um, how much of damage was due to tsunami and how much damage was due to shaking? And I don't have really solid statistics, but judging from what happened, or really large portion of that, more than probably 90% was uh, casualties and the damage was tsunami this time. And partly because Japanese structures are usually built very good. And also, my judgment is, uh, except near the south region, strength of ground motion was on the average or even somewhat lower than you'd expect when an event is fine too. So, but tsunami, well, tsunami destruction is total. I mean, if uh, tsunami comes to some town, almost uh, nothing left. I know that some of the people here uh, in the room are Uh, in terms of uh, railway? Magnitude. What is the magnitude and threshold for warning? Ah, for JMA warning. Um, actually, the threshold is based upon strength of shaking, intensity. Mm -hmm. So if intensity larger than 5 minus, I think, is expected, there is warning. 
And in this case, the expected intensity in Tokyo was 4 minus uh, on Japanese scale. That's why um, warning was not issued to Tokyo. But uh, in the northern part of the country, it was 5 minus or something. So that's the reason why they issued. Not on the basis of magnitude, it's expected intensity. And how did the, the system react to all the <laughs> Okay, <laughs> I didn't talk about it because uh, it's a very complex problem. Uh, when we say aftershock, it's not quite clear what aftershocks are. It's just uh, all, all over, all the triggered events, not only from the original epicenter, but these events happened all over the country. So it's very difficult to sort out all of them. So even if you was <laughs> issue warning, it's not quite clear what the, is, what the warning is. So. I think according to some statistics, uh, okay, I have to repeat. For the first three hours after the main event, uh, they thought it's so difficult that they didn't issue warning. Then after that, they issued warning, and some statistics uh, told us the success rate was only 30%. But I was watching TV for uh, uh, Friday evening and Sunday, Saturday, and uh, overall, I think it was very useful. When I saw that screen on TV, usually I felt some shaking, uh, maybe a minute or two minutes later. But I must say, you know, this warning during the aftershock sequence is extremely difficult. And JMA said they are going to improve it. But I'm sure when they say that, I'm sure they are thinking of using this on-site uh, method because uh, regional method, I'm sure it's really difficult because even for us it's very difficult. Uh, so by combining on-site method and regional method properly, it may be possible to improve it. But at this moment, uh, it's a very difficult problem. Many of uh, John McPartland, Barry Rapid Transit, many of us here have like disciplines that we don't have any direct connectivity with in Japan, what would be the best conduit or segue for us to be able to make contact with those disciplines so that we can network with them, find out uh, lessons learned that will be able to help us here? Do you know? I think that's a question for everybody. Right? Yeah. yeah? Well, um, there's one thing. I think Japan, Japanese government has uh, two committees. I can't remember the name. And uh, they are meeting normally, regularly, once every month or so. No, no, four times a year. But this time, of course, uh, they decide to have meetings. And uh, concern from scientific community, just like us, uh, can be given to them. And they look at them, and uh, they properly uh, digest it and uh, release it to the public. But in case of business, uh, I don't know to how much information will come to that particular government uh, institution, uh, government committee, but I think that's one of the places where we can exchange some information that you might have. Better. We've already had some uh, earthquake uh, alerting uh, workshop a year ago in Japan to discuss some of the applications. It was very interesting. Following this very large earthquake, of course, we were very interested in how people use the system, how it worked, and we tried to we tried to uh, uh, contact our Japanese colleagues, uh, who rather respectfully told us that uh, things have been pretty hectic in Japan just recently, and uh, it's. But I'm certain that uh, in the coming uh, six months or so. There will be many opportunities uh, for us to try to organize and and get the information from our Japanese colleagues. But right at this point in time, it's uh, it's still pretty uh, chaotic for them in terms of uh, spending time to communicate with us. What's the total <coughs> capital that the JMA system cost? Well, I don't think we have the final number, but. Uh, you, you mentioned some number. I think the, the um, yeah, we don't have a, com uh, a, a, a number that we also know of. And the reason is that they've been building this system up over a large number of years. 
It started after the Kobe earthquake when they decided to go invest in a significant upgrade of their seismic networks to, to something which frankly is the envy of all seismologists around the world. So that was a huge investment. And then since then, of course, they've added all of the additional components that you need for a warning system, which is the development. Um, um, it's the development, sorry, you can't hear me at the back, which is the development component, the communications component, component to get the information out to people, public education campaign, and all of these estimates. One of the numbers which we've heard, I think, twice now was that it cost about half a billion dollars in total. Has any other country adopted um, a successful system like Japan? Well, there are many, but not um, like JMA. Uh, Taiwan has uh, its own, and uh, Mexico has, but uh, also Istanbul, Turkey, uh, some, several European countries, but not at this level in terms of uh, in, uh, sending information to the public. The, in, in that case, maybe Mexico has the most yeah, advanced system. Here, I'm wondering a couple things. One is, uh, in response to one of the other questions here, would it be possible over, say, the next six months or so to get a compilation of response plans from various major segments of industry and public utilities from Japan that were in place at the time of the earthquake? That is, how were you going to react to warning? And then perhaps even better yet, how they're going to change those response plans because of the event. And the other thing is perhaps more difficult, but maybe even more important, is some kind of cost-benefit <coughs> analysis. Of course, human life is hard to put a number on, but how many lives, how many injuries, how much property damage was avoided by this warning system, and how does that compare to the cost of implementing the system? I think that ultimately people ask questions like sure. that. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering if, if it's possible I can even imagine uh, the National Academy or somebody establishing a commission to help determine that and to work with your colleagues in Japan. Well, we'll try, but uh, it's not easy, actually. It's coming very slowly. And uh, also, it's very difficult to really figure out exactly how much must have, could have been saved with uh, early warning. Because in this particular case, as I said, most of the damage was due to tsunami and the uh, shaking effect was relatively minor. But in case of tsunami, 1896 event I showed, uh, more than 100 years ago, uh, more than 20,000 pe people died, uh, considering much less population around that time. Um, certainly, um, that's a big number. But for this one, again, the total number of casualties will be probably more like uh, 20,000 to 30,000. It's comparable to that with a much, much more increased population. So I'm sure this preparedness in Japan was moving in the right direction. And uh, I, I am really personally very impressed. It's hard to say this after this tragic event, but uh, without uh, all the education, preparedness, some breakwaters, everything, I think uh, that helped tremendously. But in case of uh, Asukekari warning, um, obviously, this new technology, technology is coming into this uh, whole package of preparedness, and I'm sure it, it was very helpful. But it's hard to separate, you know, from the overall. Um, what kind of warning do people get with tsunami? Um, in uh, this you know, as far as the time-wise, uh, you know, once the shocks okay. hit. Uh, um, I think within a few minutes, I mean six minutes or so, I think we showed the slide yesterday, you remember? Uh, JMA actually sent that information saying that uh, uh, in northern part of the cities, a pre-tsunami of six meter was expected. And that came within a few minutes. However, the tsunami first wave came to the coast in about 10 minutes after the origin time. So it, it was very marginal. And I also said in the beginning that 20 minutes after the event, we had very good information regarding the size and the location of the main shock. I said 20 minutes, but that's from a global network, not necessarily from Japanese network. And technology-wise, it's very easy, probably, I think, to reduce the 20 minutes to a few minutes. And with real-time high-rate GPS, 
and improve seismic station. Technology is there. So to reduce 20 minutes to a few minutes is not really very difficult. So I'm sure tsunami warning can be improved significantly. As soon as Tom took this up, we'll switch to the next talk, but maybe there's one more question. I'm, of course, very interested in how the populace in Japan was educated on this, the early warning system and, and what they were expected to do with that early warning information. Well, in this part of Japan, northern part along the Sanriku Tohoku coast, of course, mm -hmm. they had really experienced tsunami, big tsunamis for the last hundred years. So, like Professor Motosaka's experiment, uh, every school children are very well educated, and local fishermen are very well educated. So, overall, I think uh, it's really much better than here. But maybe you want to make more comments on this? Okay. 